the aristocratic lady comes to the black neighborhood to visit the black girl who works in her house. But what she sees is a mansion and a maid who opens the door for her. Marion is confused by all this. It's not until she sees Peggy's parents that she realizes how wrong she is. Peggy's family is also very puzzled by Marion's uninvited visit because it is reasonable to bring an invitation in advance to visit someone's home. Anyway, Peggy's mother welcomes Marion out of politeness. Everyone sees the bag in her hand and thinks it's a gift. However, when she opens it, it's a bag of old shoes. Old shoes? I thought... What did you think, Miss Brooke? That we would need cast-off shoes? Marion's self-righteousness embarrassed everyone in the room. She stereotyped Peggy's family as having a hard time. So she brought second-to-hand shoes that she thought she could use. She didn't realize that Peggy's family was no worse off than hers. Even though she was colored, realizing that Marion couldn't explain what she was doing, Peggy took her and left. When she came out, she blamed Marion for making such a rude surprise visit. What are you doing here? And the shoes, what was that? Because we're colored, we must be poor. Marion and Peggy met about a month ago after losing her wallet and ticket at the station. Marion got on a train with Peggy's help and managed to join her aunt, an aristocrat in New York. And Peggy was recognized by Aunt Agnes for her good writing. Aunt Agnes keeps Peggy as her personal secretary and helps her answer the daily grind of correspondence. Peggy doesn't reveal her family's circumstances and doesn't want to go back home to work for her father because she has her own dreams that she wants to pursue at the moment. However, due to her skin color and stereotypes, her path to pursuing her dreams is more difficult than others. Peggy has a passion and talent for writing, and she sends her novel to a publisher and receives an offer to meet with her in person. However, when she arrived at the publisher's office, full of anticipation, Miss Scott? But in your letter you said that you're a secretary, but you never mentioned you were... I'm not sure we can see you today. When the assistant saw Peggy's skin color, he started to make all kinds of excuses. Peggy was determined not to give up the opportunity that was so close at hand, so she stayed and waited. It was only after everyone had left at dusk that the president of the publishing house finally met with Peggy. However, when she sat her day down, the first question she was asked was, Did you really write these stories? I'm sorry? Although her novel had been accepted by the publisher, she was still being questioned because of her skin color. After confirming Peggy's writing skills, the publisher wanted to start publishing the novel in serialized form from the first chapter and also suggested a few changes, the main one being to change the main character from a black girl to a white one. Not only that, but the publisher wanted to buy Peggy's rights to the novel outright and make her sign a pledge that she would no longer publicly identify herself as the author of the book. These bullying terms really didn't sit well with Peggy. There are at least two white men sitting in a bar around the corner drinking away their sorrows because I turned them down. They'd kill to be in your position. But they'd never be in my position. It's true that this was Peggy's favorite publisher, but she didn't have to put up with such unfair treatment. She didn't give up and continued to submit to more publishers. One day she heard back from a black publisher where she could let go of all her inhibitions and be seen only for her sparkling talent. Marion had been feeling guilty about her last reckless behavior. When she sees that Peggy's work has finally been published, she is heartily happy for her friend and sincerely apologizes to Peggy for her offense. Peggy, of course, also knows that Marion is doing things out of good intentions but in the wrong way, so she also graciously chooses to forgive. In order to secure a good marriage for the girl, her generous and buys her many new dresses, takes her to parties with celebrities, shows her the opera, and searches for a suitable husband for her. That day Larry, who lived across the street, came to visit Anna Agnes, led by her cousin. However, as the son of a nouveau rich, Larry is not well received by Anna Agnes, even though Marion is very fond of him. I'm glad to see you here. Judging by your aunt's face, it'll be a while before you see me here again. <laughs> her aunt sees their intimacy with a critical gaze. Soon after, the lawyer who had helped Marion with her father's estate came to visit. Ricks expressed his intention to move to New York, which made Marion very happy. And Ada sees the two of them chatting and thinks Rakes would be a good choice for a husband. But soon this idea is shattered by Anne Agnes. And I can't leave her any of the Van Rijn money which should and will go to Oscar. In short, without a decent marriage, she will be lost. Unmarried, and Ada retains a touch of naivety, believing that marrying for money is no guarantee of happiness. I don't wish her to marry for money, only to marry for security, support, and God-willing affection. And Agnes with all her experience, proved to be a much better judge of character than Aunt Ada. At a party soon after, Aunt Ada was reunited with an old acquaintance, 
Icard approached Ada and exchanged pleasantries, saying he was here to renew his friendship with her. The two of them never got married because their parents broke up their marriage. Marianne was so excited to hear this that she invited Mr. Icard to her home someday. However, on the day Mr. Icard visits, Marianne sneaks out for a date. Unlike Ada, Agnes is not kind to Mr. Icard from the beginning. She then sends Ada away to order the servants to prepare refreshments for three, leaving Icard to talk. I believe I should tell you my sister has little money of her own, and in the joyful event of her marrying, she would be obliged to move out and take care of herself. Icard is still insisting that he's more interested in Ada than in money. Until Agnes reveals the truth about the past, it turns out that her father's disapproval of their marriage was not due to Icard's lack of prospects, but because he heard him bragging in his bar that he was about to marry a rich woman and didn't have to work hard anymore. Hmm. Here we are. My dear Miss Ada, I'm afraid I've only just noticed the time. I'm already late for an appointment. I am sorry. Bannister, will you see Mr. Eckhart out? We can manage here. Yes. Ada doesn't understand all this, and Agnes doesn't reveal it because she doesn't want her sister to feel bad. It is clear that Aunt Agnes has always been a wise matriarch who has always been there for her family. On the other hand, Marion, who was asked by Rakes to go for a walk in the park, gradually fell into the man's rhetoric. And if it's devotion you need to be sure of, then I can say hand on heart, there is no man living who cares more for you than I. Let me spend what remains to me of life in the sole cause of making you happy. Rakes proposes to Marion the third time he meets her. And Marion simply thinks she's met her true love, knowing that her aunt will not approve of their relationship. She prepares to be with Rakes in secret. Mr. Russell's plan to build a train station continues. So he approaches Mr. Fane, another member of Parliament, and offers to make up for Mr. Fane's loss of stock if the bill is passed. But his condition was that Mrs. Fane take Mrs. Russell into the circle of noblewomen. The woman walks slowly down the stairs in a gorgeous red dress. Her elegant and graceful appearance amazed the crowd. The maid then draped her in a dark red cloak to give her an aura of luxury while keeping a low profile. Mrs. Russell, through a series of spoiling operations by her husband, has managed to enlist the help of Mrs. Fane. She had a customized plan for Mrs. Russell's integration into high society. At the top of the aristocratic wise food chain is Lady Armstrong, and that will be their ultimate goal. But Mrs. Armstrong was not someone anyone could meet at any time. Mrs. Fane had come up with another name, Ward McAllister who is Lady Armstrong's right-hand man, helping to keep her social circle in order. And to meet this ward, there were certain thresholds. Mrs. Fane began by inviting Mrs. Russell to a concert with her. There was a clear hierarchy at the concert. Tickets were easy to come by, but boxes were reserved for the nobility. Even the wealthy Russell family could only sit in the Fane's box. All the while, Mrs. Fane was introducing Mrs. Russell to the other aristocrats. Marion, who was sitting next to them, saw her boyfriend sitting in the next box. Soon Rakes came over to say hello, and that's how he became acquainted with Mrs. Russell and Mrs. Fane. Rakes told Marion that he was here with a wealthy noblewoman. He knows that Marion's aunt will look down on him, so he'll have to work his way up the ladder and try to make the best of his situation by meeting the rich and powerful. He did it all for Marion. After a brief chat, Rakes was called back to the box by the noblewoman. Marion was surprised to see how Rakes had gone from being a nobody to interacting naturally with the aristocrats. After Mrs. Russell's appearance in high society, Mrs. Fane prepares to host a luncheon at her home for Mr. Ward. After receiving Mr. Ward's affirmative answer, Mrs. Russell happily shared the good news with her husband, feeling that she was one step closer to high society. On the day of the luncheon, Mr. Ward makes the last entrance as the crowd waits. Mrs. Fane arranges for Mrs. Russell to sit across from Mr. Ward to make it easier for them to talk during the meal. Mr. Ward talked about his interest in the Russell's mansion. Mrs. Russell went out of her way to flatter him and make a good impression. I'd love to think you would be my protector. For now, fairly soon, I'd say you'll be protecting me. <laughs> <laughs> After making Mr. Ward's acquaintance, Mrs. Fane took Mrs. Russell to a Red Cross fundraiser. High society people are always going to charity events to make a name for themselves and show their status. But it was here that Mrs. Russell saw Mrs. Morris, who considered her an enemy. Not long ago, Mr. Morris had tricked Mr. Russell in the stock business. And in the end, he'd taken his own life. Widowed, Mrs. Morris's hatred of the Russells increased, and she refused to allow them to enter high society. But Mrs. Russell's donations were too great, and she was applauded for her generosity. At a subsequent meeting of the members, Mrs. Fane proposes that Mrs. Russell be present. Mrs. 
Morris is the first object. On a show of hands, only three voted in favor. Then the president of the Red Cross stepped forward. I would like to remind you, no one in this city has done more real good for my cause. So money is the deciding factor here, yet again. What a sad and vulgar world we live in. We are not arranging a debutante ball, Mrs. Morris. We are raising money to bring help to people in dire need all over this country. See, Mrs. Russell get what she wanted. Mrs. Morris was furious and left. And now Mrs. Russell was getting closer to her goal. 